Okay, so it is being recorded, fair warning. If you wanna mute your um, videos, feel free to, to do so. Um, my name is Bree Kirsch. I am, um, well, I was a university librarian and I was recently promoted to associate provost of for the library and information technology. So now I am over library and IT um, at my institution, Briarcliff University in Sioux City, Iowa. So let's talk about generative AI. And I did a similar presentation for librarians over the past summer, which is how Lisa found out about it and asked me to do a similar session for all of you today. And before that, I did a session very similar to it um, for my faculty at my institution, and they found it to be interesting and helpful and generated a lot of discussion. So hopefully that'll do the same for all of you as well. All right, so first, here's our agenda. We'll chat a little bit about what generative AI is as opposed to discriminative AI. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the different types of chat bots that are out there, as well as image generation and synthesis, research, and other types of generative AI. Then we will also have a discussion of how generative AI affects instruction. So first, what is generative AI? Does anybody have an idea? I know some of you probably are familiar with some of the options out there already, but if anyone wants to chime in, either within the chat or unmute yourselves and verbally, what is generative AI? And I'll just pause and see if anyone wants to chime in either on the chat or in verbally. Okay. I, I, so. am, I am not gonna answer because I already saw the presentation. So <laughs> that is that. fine. Okay, I do have a no clue in the chat. That's fine. That's why we're gonna chat about it today. All right. Well, feel free to keep typing in the chat if you so choose throughout the session. Um, I'd like this to be interactive rather than me lecturing because I'm not a big lecturer. Um, but let's go ahead to the next slide and talk about what is generative AI. So according to oneentrepreneur.com, this is a definition of generative AI. And it's fairly lengthy, so I'll just let you take a moment to read it if you so choose. But essentially, it's a type of AI that creates information based on patterns with in what it already has in terms of information. So it generates new content. And that last sentence there, unlike discrim discriminative AI, which focuses on classifying or labeling data, generative AI creates new data that didn't exist before. So that's kind of the basis of the definition of generative versus discriminative AI. And According to ChatGPT, I thought I'd see what that said about generative versus discriminative AI. And I'm not gonna read this whole thing to you. There's a lot of text on this page, um, but essentially discriminative models of AI are used for tasks like image classification, speech recognition, and sentiment analysis. And this could also be used in things like surveillance systems or security systems versus generative AI are used for things like image or text generation, speech synthesis, and anomaly detection. And that's used for generating new content. So there are a lot of types of generative AI out there already, and more are being created daily. And Lisa, there will be one new one I'll cover today than I did over the summer that was new to me as of, I think, two weeks ago. So uh, new stuff's coming out all the time with generative AI, and it's going to be interesting to see what they come up with next. But just to run through these very briefly, um, under the different types of generative AI, chatbots are probably the most well-known in terms of chat GPT, especially. That's the one everybody's talking about. But there are a lot of other ones out there, like Perplexity is another chatbot that I actually think is a little bit more reliable than chat GPT in certain ways, which I'll talk about in a little bit. We also have image generation and thin synthesis tools like Mid Journey, Stable Diffusion, or Night Cafe. Personally, I like Night Cafe, and I'll show you that one today. 
Under research, there are tools like Elicit and Research Rabbit. That's the new one. And then we have music generation and composition tools like Ava, Soundful, and Murph. And then video, they're still new. Um, they're still working on some video ones, but the one I've heard about is Gen 2 Runway, although I haven't played with it much since the free version. You can only do a few seconds video at this point, and they're still working on it. Um, but there are others out there like Slide GPT for creating slides, uh, Open AI Codex, Code T5, Tab 9, and there are others. So the, the list is endless and there are new ones being created all the time. And just as an example with Tab 9 there, I haven't looked at it myself, but I do know that it involves drug discovery and design. So it's pretty impressive what different things are coming out um, in terms of generative AI and thinking about what it could do for us, um, as well as what it's already doing. So let's start with the one that everybody is talking about, ChatGPT. What is it? Well, I asked ChatGPT, and according to um, ChatGPT, um, that's going to be on the next slide, but OpenAI is the company that designed ChatGPT, and um, it is trained to interact in a conversational way. So I'd like to see how many of you have used ChatGPT. So if you want to put in the chat a Y for yes, an N for no, that would be very helpful to me. So I know how much detail to go into for this one. Okay, so if I'm seeing a bunch of guesses, that's kind of what I would have expected because most people probably have at least seen it if not tested it out themselves at this point. Okay, I do see one no, which is totally fine. It's okay, I did not expect you to have all experienced ChatGPT at this point. Okay, so Cynthia's seen it, but not used it yet. And that is totally fine. I will show you a couple examples um, of all of the tools I'll focus on today um, and then see if you have any questions. All right, so <clears throat> I'm gonna go to the next slide and not read all of this text to you. So as you might expect, ChatGPT is popular with our students. It can provide study support with creating practice questions related to course content, summarizing technical articles, explaining theories or content in easier language, such as high school or elementary level. Um, so, so for some of those highly technical courses and materials that it's really difficult to understand, you can try to put the content into chat GPT and ask it to rephrase it in a more understandable way. And it can be pretty accurate. Um, it's also helpful for brainstorming and it could help ESL students with language barriers. So those are some of the possibilities with students and using ChatGPT, but it can also be used for cheating as I'm sure some of you have already probably talked about with others. It's definitely a concern for a lot of faculty on my campus and probably a lot of other campuses. So students can ask it to answer discussion board questions. They can also ask it to write a short essay based on prompts. And there are definitely challenges with it. If you've used it for any length of time, you've probably noticed um, ChatGPT does not cite its sources. It will make up sources, it hallucinates, and it makes things up. So it's not always 100% accurate. You've always got to take it with a grain of salt and always check real sources or like peer reviewed articles to back up what it's saying just because you can't trust it, it makes up things. So I asked ChatGPT to write me an essay on information literacy, which is a very librarian thing. Essentially, it just means the research process. It's very tiny font, I'm not gonna read this to you, but it did try to write me a short essay. Um, you know, it has some decent information in there and um, it's, it's a decent essay, I would say, for what it is. But of course, it doesn't have any citations. So that's definitely something to consider. So if nothing else, if the student turned this in as their own work, they would be caught for plagiarizing because they don't have any citations whatsoever. So moving on to perplexity. This is a tool very similar to ChatGPT. It's um, an AI language model. I asked Perplexity what it was, and it's a computer program designed to process and generate human language. 
but it's unclear what the context of the question, what are you, is referring to. It could be asking for a person's name or role, or it could be a deeper question about self-identity. And then it actually has some citations here, in-text citations, which is very helpful. So it shows the four sources that it found this information from, supposedly, but it did go off in a philosophical discussion here at the end. Um, and it brought up these sources at the bottom. Stack Exchange, Psychology Today, YouTube, and Glamour. So not the most high quality of sources, but it's at least listing where it got information from. So I would say that's a step up from ChatGPT. <clears throat> and then I asked it another question just to give you another example. How can I make library services more inclusive in higher education? And then it gives me a short answer here about how I could do so. And again, it lists its sources. In this case, ARL, so Association of Research Libraries, I believe is what it stands for, Valencia College, American Library Association, and I think that's Louisiana State University. So a little bit more reliable information, especially based on the question I asked. So again, at least it's citing where it got information from, unlike ChatGPT. And Lisa's comment in the chat, this set are actually good sources. I can't tell if I'm delighted or horrified. Yeah. So it really depends on the question. And some topics, it'll be better qualified to answer than others, depending on where it's pulling its information from. There's always a challenge with ChatGPT and how accurate it is, um, as well as perplexity and other chatbots. Um, but it's pretty interesting seeing what it can do and what its capabilities are. So moving on to pictures, and I think that Lisa asked me to actually show you some of these tools. So let me um, get out of the slide show for a moment and see if I can pull up perplexity. Okay, can you see the perplexity screen now? Good. So this is what perplexity looks like. I asked it, how does generative AI affect instruction? Now it looks a little different um, because it moved things around since I last took the screenshots. It actually puts the um, sources up here of where you could go to find more detailed information on that question. And then it gives you the answer below it with the citations listed still. So instead of the citations listed on the bottom with the links there, they actually put more of the title there. Um, so you can actually click on it to see what that original source was. So I kind of like that update. Um, is there another question that we might want to ask it? Let's see, new thread. What should we ask it? Anybody have a thought? <laughs> Does someone want to ask like a discussion board question or, okay, so how about this? Um, what would be good discussion board questions for introduction to geology? Okay. Okay, so again, it pulls up some sources right there at the top, Geology Forum, Discussion Board, Instructions from Course Hero, something from Carleton, Essay Writer, Geology Science, Course Hero, and then it gives us um, some good discussion board questions for introduction to geology. It has 10 listed here. And then it says these questions are based on search results from these places. They cover a range of topics related to geology, including those, and they're designed to encourage students to apply, explore, and reflect on course topics. So it's a decent starting point to thinking about discussions. Um, I probably would make them a little bit more in depth than what's listed here myself as a faculty member, but you know, it depends on what you want them to work on. Um, this, maybe these could be used as quick entrance tickets for a class session or something, but it's a starting point. Anyone want to do anything else in perplexity before we move on? Um, Josh asked, what are the steps for drawing blood? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that, okay. Oh, Lyle has, what are the root causes of the Civil War? It, we're piling on now. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just choose Lyle's there because it's easy to copy and paste in. Root causes of the Civil War, okay. So it has these sources here. 
PBS, NPS, um, some other places. And then it gives us the example, root causes, um, slavery, states' rights, territorial expansion, economic policies and practices, cultural values, et cetera. And then it's based on those places. Okay, I'm gonna, can I ask a weird follow-up? Sure. Um, can we ask it to use academic sources only? I don't believe so, but okay. we can try. Like peer-reviewed articles, do we want to go that route? I don't think it'll do peer-reviewed articles, but. Um, I just want to see what it says, what it thinks of academic sources. Oh, the scholarly is great, okay. Let's see what it does. So it's bringing up university websites. It looks like a Lib Answers page. Um, academic scholarly sources can be used to find your answer. And then here we go. Yeah, so it's from the college's um, websites, it looks like. So that's how they go about <laughs> making it more scholarly and academic. Hmm, interesting. Okay, let me see what else you've said in the chat. Okay, do you guys want me to keep going with perplexity or should I move on? Because I don't want to take the whole time doing perplexity either. I know there's others, but could you do um, the sociological perspectives one that Cynthia okay, had? Let's see. Please. Yes. Because she that. just wrote this for a discussion board for a class. I'm working in that class right now. So apply the sociological perspectives to a social issue. Is that the one? Yes. That's yeah. One. Oh, that's not doing the hold on. And it's summarizing. So sometimes it takes it a minute. <laughs> um, but it looks like, again, it's pulling from NPS, PBS, um, some of those earlier studies. I'll take that as a good sign that it's summarizing so long. <laughs> yeah, it's taking quite a while, actually. Usually it's a little faster than this. That's good. If it's too vague for them to answer, <laughs> I am not in opposition. Or it could just be my internet. You never know. <laughs> um. Well, while that's thinking, um, are there any other questions I can answer verbally right now about perplexity or chatty, chat GPT? My husband calls it chatty, so sometimes I refer to it that way. When it comes to the stuff it generates, what sort of like legal, who owns it when it generates? That's a good question. And I don't have a good answer because that's still to be determined, I think, by the government or whoever is going to be determining that down the road. Um, but yeah, that is a good question. Um, I would say it's interesting because I know some people are using it to write parts of peer reviewed journal articles that they're submitting for publication. And so then, well, the person who submitted it as the author would say they own it, but you know, it, it depends on how much they edit those before submitting, I guess. And also, oh, let's see, there was a recent court decision that said companies couldn't copyright AI generated material and will be in dispute for a while. Yes, I can definitely imagine it will be for sure. Uh, Lisa, did you have something to add on? I did. It is your internet because I just, I, I downloaded okay. the Okay, I'll, I'll try and, to read. And I got an answer terrifying let's see if it did it okay and, yeah it didn't do that yeah so i mean i can i will take a screenshot and share it with cynthia and josh and they will not be happy oh now it came up it just there was having a lagging for a second um so yeah it provides us functionalism conflict theory symbolic interactionism um and it talks about the sources that they used so including Cliff's notes, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, yeah, so that's perplexity. We can come back to this if there's time at the end, if you have more questions about perplexity, but I do want to go back to the slides since there's more to talk about. Um, so let me open that up. There we go. 
So let's move on and talk about picture generation. So I personally like Night Cafe. That's the one I usually use if I want to create images based on text prompts. So in this case, I have four images here that Night Cafe created for me based on my prompt, photorealistic college students and professor working on a project in the library. Um, and mostly I've just been using this to test and see what it'll create for me. Um, I know my husband, he's an author, and he'll use it to try to create images for his book covers because he, he's an author. Um, so he'll use it in that way. And I know other people are using it in other ways. Um, so yeah, this is an image generating tool. And I know some of you might be interested in intellectual property and how that works or copyright. So here is what they have listed in their terms and conditions. I'm not going to read it all to you, um, but I will have it posted here and then you can view it in the recording. And it's also on their website as well. Um, but essentially the gist of it is um, that once that all intellectual property rights subsisting in that specific artwork is transferred to you and you may use your artwork for personal or commercial purposes. However, they provide no warranties that we will be able to trademark or claim copyright ownership of the artwork or that any trade cop trademark application or copyright claim will not infringe on any third party intellectual property rights. So it's up to you. <laughs> it's up to the individual. They are avoiding any kind of um, issues that might arise if you use what they create. Um, and I see Cynthia put something in the chat. Um, we could use those pictures for course material or is online staying away from that? I'm not sure if I understand your question, Cynthia. Um, but theoretically, yes, we could use images generated from this tool if we wanted to. It was more to Lisa anyway, so she okay. answered this thing. Okay. <laughs> so that's uh, the very basics of Night Cafe. And let's see. Yeah. So let's go and look at it now. Okay, so this is what Night Cafe looks like. Um, once I logged in and I clicked create, then it brought me to this page. I clicked this to see what the different model options are. So it gives you several different options here um, for what you might want to use to create your image. So it's different types of images. So we have stable diffusion, SDXL, um, and it has little informations here about the different types of images. So for example, this one, great at high resolution photorealism and detail. Um, we've got this one, bigger than the first gen stable models, easier to prompt for. Um, here's an open AI image generator. So again, that's the same company that created ChatGPT. And then we've got clip guided diffusion. And I don't know what some of these things stand for. I am not an artist or a graphic designer, um, but I just like playing with it. So let's just pick one of these just to see. Um, let's go with this one since it's good for high res resolution photorealism and detail. So now we need a prompt. Does somebody want to give me a prompt maybe in the chat so I can copy and paste it, make it a little easier? So I'll give you a minute just to think about what prompt we might want to give it, a text prompt to create an image for us. Hmm, that's an interesting one. Okay, William Shakespeare performing in the Globe Theater. Let's try it out and see what happens. All right, so then we've got to choose which style we want. There's a lot of options in this tool. So we have artistic portrait, night cafe, which is kind of the basic one, um, striking, anime, hyper real, vibrant. Let's see, there are a lot of different options here. So I'll just scroll through so you can see some of them. And they've added more since I last used it. So are there any preferences <laughs> to which one we use? Did any of those stand out to you? I didn't see, but uh, could you go something that is the most realistic? I'm just curious to see where um, it goes. So like either the color portrait, maybe? 
You want to do color portrait? We could try that. Yeah, I think that's what he's looking for. Okay. And let's do four images. And so how this works is um, Night Cafe is free. You get five credits a day. Obviously, I go in and check mark my little accept your five credits <laughs> for the day each day. And it adds up pretty quick if you don't use it very frequently. So I have quite a few credits saved up here. Um, so I'll cl click create. And so I'm spending 12 credits for creating four images on my prompt. And it can take a little while at times. Sometimes it'll get a little funky and it will not create it for us um, properly. And it'll kind of freeze in part way through, but usually it's fairly quick. Um, yeah, so it's running, it takes some time. And then eventually it will load for us. And then it shows us the prompt and the resolution etc. So I can click done and then wait and then I can go to my creations and we'll see. Yeah, so it did pull it up here. So let me open that up. So it has these four images. So I can click on each one individually to see what it looks like. So, you know, they're pretty good. Their eyes don't look weird or anything. Some of the settings, if you use a weird setting, their eyes will be misshapen and it'll look really wonky. <laughs> like, especially the earlier ones, they've gotten better. Um, this one, these ones in particular are pretty good. Um, so yeah, that's an example of Night Cafe and using it to create images. <laughs> so let's see, I see there's some chats. Racism during Jim Crow in America, and it came up with this one. Yeah, so I agree. It is fun to tinker with things. Um, there's a lot of, I mean, it'll, it'll create anything based on text prompts. Now, sometimes it's not very accurate, completely different than what you had originally said um, or what you were looking for. So it, it all depends on what prompt you use. You might have to rephrase things a few times. But yeah, thanks for doing that, Cynthia. I'm glad to see another example there. Um, so yeah, if, if you want, you can create your own accounts and try it out and see what you can create. Um, but it, yeah, it's pretty interesting to see what the tool will do. There are other tools out there. I personally use this one just because it's easy, um, in my opinion. Um, the other pretty popular one is MidJourney, but it does require the use of a Discord app. And I'm not a big Discord person, so I um, choose Night Cafe since I can just go to the website and use it. Any questions about Night Cafe before I move on? No? All right, then let's go back and talk about my personal favorite tools as a librarian, um, the, the research tools. So we're moving on to research. So what is Elicit? Well, according to Elicit, it's a research assistant using language models like ChatGPT or GPT-3 to automate parts of researchers' workflows. So the main workflow in Elicit is the literature review. And if you're in academia, you might know how time intensive literature reviews can be to create. So um, if you ask it a question, it will show you relevant papers and summaries of key information about those papers in an easy to use table. So I asked it the prompt, how does UDL affect student achievement? And for those that don't know, UDL stands for Universal Design for Learning. This is what it gave me. It gave me a summary of the top four papers, which is in beta. And this is the quotation from Elicit in terms of summarizing a response to my question. Now I will say um, I'm working on my PhD in education, instructional design and technology, and I am studying UDL. Um, I'm beginning my dissertation on universal design for learning application and implementation in higher education by faculty and instructional designers. So I've read a lot on UDL lately, and I've actually read the ISO article 
um, and the Shelley article and the OK article. Um, the only one I hadn't at this point when I made this originally was the Use Lou article from 2017. So it's actually pulling from fairly scholarly sources, which is pretty neat to see, I would say. So here's what a screenshot from it looks like, and it gives you the paper title and the abstract summary, which is probably um, just a few sentences or a sentence based on the abstract for the article, which is helpful because that's sometimes all you can see um, for free. You can usually see the abstract for an article for free. So it's trying to collect and um, make a concise response to your research question based on scholarly sources. And then in another screen here, if you click on one of the articles, it gives you the abstract, which is again, usually available for free. And then it gives you the citation information. Um, so that's it for illicit. So let me open up illicit now so you can see what that looks like. Okay, so I just asked it, how does generative AI affect instruction, which is something we'll chat about later in the discussion portion. And it gave me a summary here. So this is where the summary is located. And then it gives me some related papers. And in this case, I think there's two to three, like seven or eight. Um, and it gave me article um, summaries from the abstracts. Um, yes, I see a hand raised. You might be getting ready to address this point, but I, I just have to ask, in this particular search engine, they're pulling from scholarly sources, meaning it's pulling from sources that are verifiable and do exist, and it's not hallucinating or fabricating any of this source data. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Yes. These are real articles. <laughs> Unlike ChatGPT that makes up articles, these are real. Yes, that is correct. Um, and you can limit it to articles with PDFs. So in other words, open source articles. So if it's publicly available and has a PDF available, um, you can limit it to that in this, so in this tool as well. Um, so if I scroll down, you can also say show more, which is helpful. So if you say, okay, these seven are a nice starting point, but I want to know what other articles are written about this. And it gives me more. And then I can keep clicking show more and it'll give me additional additional articles and just keep going and keep going. So it's a pretty neat tool. Um, mostly it is trying to collect scholarly papers, scholarly articles, and then make those easy to see. And you can easily check the summary of the abstract and kind of determine, well, is this an article I really want to read for my lit review or not? And then if you click on an article, just to show you, this is that screen. So it gives you the abstract. If the article is available, it does give you the full article as well, um, or brief um, parts of the article. So yeah, it's pretty lengthy. And then on the left-hand side, it asks, can I trust this paper? No mention found of study type funding source, participant count, et cetera. So this is probably not a scholarly uh, or a experimental study. It's probably just more of a conceptual paper is my guess. Um, but if you scroll down, there are critiques of the paper and other people that have cited this source. So this can be a really effective tool depending on what you're looking for in the topic, because I'm sure some topics are more available than others in this tool, but it it's pretty impressive what it can provide you. Um, so I see, are, do you still have your hand raised? Is that a new question? No, I'm good, thank you so much. Okay, just wanted to check in with that. Um, any other questions about illicit? Because there's a lot here, a lot of information. No? Okay, then we'll keep going. Uh, let me go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Research Rabbit, which is my newest one. I've not played with it a whole lot yet. I wish I had known about it or it, I wish it had been created before I did my lit review for my PhD dissertation because it would have been so helpful. <laughs> so I've just been playing with it a little bit and looking into Universal Design for Learning just to see what it would show up, what it would give me. 
So you can put in one article, which I did here. Um, I just put in the DOI URL and um, it gave me a bunch of other articles that are related or that are connected to that article. So how it finds those is if they cite each other. So if one cites a previous one, it'll have a connection between those two. So it gives you a nice visual of how the articles are connected um, with the different authors and the different years of publication. So this is a really neat tool that I need to dig more into still. It's still a fairly new tool for me, um, but it's, it's pretty exciting what possibilities there are with it, um, especially if you're trying to do a really in-depth um, lit review or um, beginning a dissertation or something along those lines. Um, I probably wouldn't necessarily share it with undergrad students just because it is a bit more in depth than they probably would need um, unless they're doing like a big final um, seminar paper or something. Um, so yeah, this is Research Rabbit and I'll show you it on another screen in a little bit. Um, but also, Let's see, yeah, so that's the next slide. So let me actually go um, back here to Research Rabbit. Okay, so this is Research Rabbit. And if I click on under Explore Papers, I clicked Similar Work, and it pops up all of these articles that are similar to my original articles here. So if I click on one, um, it shows me connections between my collection and 40 papers. And then I selected a paper. It popped up with the paper information. Um, and it says no PDF is available, but I could probably go and find it from my library's website. And then I can click on similar work to this specific article. So I can go down a rabbit hole, literally. So I think that's why it's called Research Rabbit. Um, because you can just keep going to the different articles and digging and digging and seeing how it's related to other articles. You can zoom in, um, you can click on ones like the Eddie Byrne, that's a pretty big article um, in UDL. And then you could again, click on similar work. You can also click on references. So what this article cited as well as all citations. And I believe the all citations one is all the articles that cited this article, which, as I said, this is a pretty big one that a lot of people know about for UDL. And I think this is saying there are 278 other articles that cite this article. Um, and then this, again, shows you all of those connections and if any of those are articles cite other articles as well. So I like that this one gives you a nice visual as well. Um, in terms of seeing how the different articles are connected to each other. So this is a pretty interesting tool. I need to dig more on it and play with it some more, but it's, I wish I'd known about it before I wrote my dissertation lit review because it would have been very helpful at that point in time. Um, any questions about this one before I move back to my slides and then we have a brief discussion? I just had the quick question. Do we know where... Um, where all it pulls from is are there um works? you know that's a good question and I'm not a hundred percent sure um I think that they're trying to get access to some of the paid subscriptions but they aren't sharing the actual article they're just looking for articles that are cited from the article so they're they're linking the citations together in other words more than anything in the references so you're not actually getting the articles themselves unless it's open access and openly available. You can upload articles to this one. Um, and you can create a collection like in here, like you would in um, EndNote and some of those other tools. So you can house your articles here. It will not show share those articles with anyone else because they they are aware of copyright, which is good. As a librarian, I'm like, yay, thank you. Um, so they'll protect copyright and everything, but um, you can house your articles in here and then compare and contrast and see how they're all connected and everything as well, which is kind of neat. So there's a lot this cool tool can do. Um, I, like I said, I need to explore it more, um, but it's, it's pretty neat what it can do. Um, but yeah, they're still working on it. All of these tools are still being improved upon. So there may be some glitches or weird things with it, like all of the new tools, um, but it's, it's pretty impressive what it can do from what I've seen so far. All right. Um, any other questions about this one before I move back to the slides? 
No. All right, and we can jump back there if we have time later as well. Okay, so this is a slide about why should we use generative AI in the classroom? Well, first off, this technology is not going away. Cat's out of the bag. It's not gonna be able to be shoved back in. Now that it's here, it's here to stay. And so let's figure out how to use it to our advantage and not use it in bad ways. And how can we help our students use it in effective ways? So according to Schroeder 2023, a thousand business leaders in the US were surveyed in February and they shared that 48% of them had replaced at least some workers with ChatGPT since November. By the end of 2023, 33% said they definitely would lay off workers due to ChatGPT, and 26% said probably. 92% of business leaders said it was beneficial for job applicants to have ChatGPT or AI experience. So as a result, it does behoove us to teach our students how to use and evaluate these tools since they will likely need to use them in their future workplaces. But as we probably all know by now, generative AI does have its challenges. And do keep in mind, just like ed tech tools in general, there is a free version today. It may not be free tomorrow. Free versions are limited and they may eventually disappear. These generative AI tools are creating new things that you can use, but be careful. We don't know where they're getting inspiration from and may be very similar to copyrighted material, especially the Night Cafe image generating tools. For chatbots, it's important to evaluate information from them to determine accuracy and avoid believing hallucinations. And I listed some other challenges there as well, including privacy, the hallucinations, ghost sources, inaccurate information, biases, date range of content, plagiarism and academic integrity, but also detection tools are becoming available, but they're also giving us false positives as well. So those are some challenges to be aware of. But as a librarian, I am happy to say librarians are awesome. One library and a couple librarians from McGill Library created the AI Robot Test. So this is a tool that can help students think about how to evaluate AI. Consider the reliability, the objective, the bias, the ownership, and type of AI tool. And there are so, so many articles, videos, podcasts, et cetera, available now about generative AI. I did create a collection of some of those resources on a LibGuide related to AI. And it's just briarcliff.libguides.com slash AI. And I'll paste that in the chat in a moment. Um, but I'd like us to discuss this question now. How does generative AI affect instruction? And this is the um, information about the robot um, test that I talked about a moment ago. Okay, so let me paste that um, URL for the library guide in here into the chat so you can access it if you want. And that also has um, copies of the presentations and slides that me and some of the other faculty at my institution did for faculty at Briarcliff University. So feel free to check those out if you're interested. Uh, we talked about a uh, generative AI policy and some other things that might be of interest to you. So you might wanna check those out. So I thought what we could do for the last 15 minutes is talk about this question. How does generative AI affect instruction as faculty, as designers, in our roles in academia? What do we think? Does anyone wanna chime in on this one? I mean, I've been thinking about this since I first saw this presentation in, in June. And, you know, there's a certain amount of panic. Um, I, I also think that we need, I, I think in some ways it's gonna push us to make the students be more reflective and more and engage in more active critical thinking. Um, since it seems from this look that, um, that simply evaluative answers or just 
content, you know, straight, what is the answer to this question that the computer cannot do that for us. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna stop sharing so I yeah. can see you I wanna know instead. what I wanna <laughs> know what Cynthia thinks that she's in the middle of designing a course right now. Repeat the question, Lisa, I'm sorry. I wanna know what you think about what this means in terms of, because specifically, you know, this group, we're talking about how we design the classes and the shells that will be used. So, so Bree, the thing I didn't explain is that, so like Cynthia's writing the 160, Sociology 160 course. So we offer what, 15 sections of that a year mm -hmm. or more. And so all of those sections will be the same. And so how do we, so what does this mean for how you will design the course? I mean, that's the thing I don't have an answer to that I think we're trying to figure out. I, I think that that is such a large question overall that faculty are asking, not just of online classes, but in C classes as well. Um, I know for me in particular, I kind of find there's always something new out there that we have to find our way around. Like students will always find a way to do something. Um, I don't know, because that's the exact question that I'm having constantly with all of my colleagues. I mean, I know that Kim and I have had that same conversation with Patrick. Um, I know that, yeah, it's been a constant conversation for all of us. I don't have the, I don't know. I don't know how we're going. I know it's a huge concern for everybody, but nobody really knows. And, and now, with, I think it was you that since we've been talking about the I-4, the articles from other people that you sent out yesterday, about citations now being kind of created by AI too. So and my well, that's, I, I'm I'm gonna jump in there, although that's yeah. kind of been happening already. They use these tools yeah. where you plug and chug the information and don't create it themselves, even though it would take like half as long to just create it themselves. So yeah. Right. Yeah. And so there's just I mean like I said, I feel like as soon as we come up with something to get around something, some new tool pops up. But this is a big concern and I I mean, I've been trying to keep assignments more personal, more specific to the students, more reflective to help with that. That's what we're trying to do in the um, in the new course was try to make very reflective type assignments. And I'm hoping that will help a little bit, but we'll see. So I'm going to ask a pointed question and I don't have an answer. This is me just, I'm, you know, been thinking about it. So to what extent would it be useful? So in a discussion board to say, okay, so go use the chat bot see what it says in answer to this question and compare it to what your, you know, your colleague said last week in the same question and who had the best answer, you know, and what does that mean? I think we're definitely going to have to find ways to use it to our benefit, to have it be a tool, just as kind of has been illustrated here. Um, and our, my PhD program, we're encouraged to use it as a critical tool to like what you just said is to go in and put it in and then criticize it, critique it, illustrate what works what doesn't work um and so it's it's we're encouraged so but we if we do use it it has to be cited or we automatically get kicked out of the entire program so i don't know I, I think it's kind it, of interesting yeah i was gonna i think i think it's important for us to use it in some way to um inform the students of how it can be used kind of negatively, but also to kind of raise their ability to detect hallucinations. So like that reflective um, part so that they they understand when they're being misled by AI. But if we if we just avoid and I'm not saying this what we're what we're doing, especially on online and, and collectively at MCC, but if we just kind of fear it and avoid it, <laughs> we're we're not really, we're not really, we're not really doing a service to the students. I also think it's different in sociology than it might be in psych for Kim or history for Lyle, where sociology is already so reflective. Um, whereas when you have to get to the more students have to know facts, they have to know the answer to things. I think that's where it gets more complicated too. Well, and I don't, I mean, Josh, this is a question for you. I remember when when we first started playing with chat, didn't you have it do something weirdly reflective, like a teacher diversity statement or something? I'm trying to remember now. Now now I am trying to remember. We we did um 
I think we made it give it like an educational philosophy for teaching. That's what we did. So did it, but it seemed like it seemed reflexive, right? I don't remember what I had for lunch. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> you had that. I just rhythm. remember thinking, oh my God, it did a pretty good job here. And yeah, so I don't know. I just, I don't know. I don't know. Brie, what are you seeing with amongst your people? Are they using it? or Some they, are definitely are using it. Others are avoiding it <laughs> as much <laughs> as possible. Um, some faculty are having people submit stuff that are obviously by chat GPT. It even says, as a language, blah, blah, blah. I cannot, blah, blah. And they just copy and paste it in for discussion boards. And she's like, yeah, plagiarism. So... And then you have to have a strict uh, policy for your classroom. Um, our institution decided to be vague in terms of if it's allowed or not and left it up to individual faculty. So it does say that under academic integrity now for our institution, if students, um, if students are not allowed to explicitly use it, that they should not use it in their classes, but it's up to individual faculty if they want to use it or not. And um, I know our writing faculty member um, has been using it for assignments to um, get it to show what it would write for a prompt and then have the students write something um, evaluating it. Um, so again, that evaluation piece can actually be really beneficial for them. And that can be a really good way to use chat GPT and some of these other tools to really get them their higher critical thinking skills going. I was listening to um, a piece by NPR. It was probably about two months ago. I was actually telling some of my colleagues about it. And they did this. They have um, this kind of program in a healthcare thing to allow doctors to fill out their paperwork and stuff. And they can put, or type in like symptoms and it will suggest treatments. But what's interesting is that it was actually internalizing, the, the, the program itself was internalizing the biases of the people that built it, right? And so, for example, they put in a bunch of diagnosis things, and then they put, you know, like white male, 44, heart, this is the symptoms, and they said, this person needs to go to the doctor. And they put in the same things, and then put black male, same exact symptoms, and they said, this person needs to go to jail, <laughs> And like that is, so there's, there's way you can use it to actually, at least in sociology, we can use it to illustrate and have students use critical thinking to be able to illustrate that. And so I agree with Doug. I think that it's, you're, we're going to have to find a way. It's their future. They're going to have to figure out how to use it. And evaluate it. That's the And evaluate part. it in a mm -hmm. great critical way. Yes. I will say I have offered to train my students on how to use chat GPT as an educational platform to be able to help them with studying and things like that and stuff no student has taken me up on the offer mm -hmm. they ignore the fact that I even post the announcement that hey we're this is offered to you let me know if you're interested nobody's interested I think they would rather us not know that they've got it and they're, oh, they're of course. using it <laughs> than for them to actually learn the proper procedures and things and stuff that they should be doing. It's like Google, right? We don't have Google either. We can't look up the same thing that they do. It's so amazing. That's what they think sometimes. A quick question. With the research rabbit, and I believe that was the one you were referencing, um, you said it was just basically pulling from abstracts. So is there one that will compare the um, results of a piece of research, um, and is that something you, that um, some medium will allow them to pull that information from and compare and contrast that information? Well, I know that research, well, Elicit, I know, will pull from um, open source articles, like the full text of it, if it's publicly available. Um, but for those that are behind a paywall or a subscription, um, they are not able to do that. Um, I don't know if other tools are trying to do that or not. Um, with ResearchRabbit, in terms of the references, because it's all about linking the citations and the references together, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure how they're getting it um, or where they're getting all the information from. I know a lot of it's through the openly available information on just websites in general. Um, that are open access, but I think it is pulling from some of the databases as well. Um, and again, I'm not 100% sure on that just because it's a new tool to me. 
what, one more follow-up question. Uh, would you have the, uh, if it's pulling from open source, you wouldn't know what years specifically, or if there's an, ex, you know, if there's well, years of publication excluded for, from what they pulled. For both Elicit and um, Research Rabbit, it does list the year of publication as well. But there's not a year or a group of years that are excluded from what it pulls from. Like, it's not necessarily, is it pulling from all publications or is it pulling from publications from um, in the recent, because I'd heard something about that, that if you were looking for them to, if you're if you're referencing a newer article, it wouldn't pull information from newer articles. But it I don't probably know that depends that. on if it's in a subscription or not. If it's openly available, open source, then probably it would include it since it's has access to the web. Is my understanding. Um, but I'm with the subscription models. I'm not sure how quickly it would have access to this um, abstract and citation information. So if you wait, sorry, one more question. So if you ask. If you had a question and it was, ref, you know, discuss some concept as it relates to a, an article that just recently came out this year, it, it would be hard for them, especially if you knew that article was behind a paywall or from a subscription source, it would be hard for them to pull that in a chat GT, GTP or research rabbit or illicit source. Is that correct? Let's try it out because <laughs> I don't know. I Kim, I think you're being awfully hopeful there. Um, let's see I, if there's, because these ones I'm seeing are all 2021, 20, uh, 22. There are some more recent ones, but again, if it's like from 2023 or something, they may not quite have them yet. So I'd say maybe up to a year is probably pretty good. Um, but again, I'm not 100% sure on what topics are available and what topics are less covered. Um, you just have to play with it and see. Because um, like I said, this is still a new tool to me. But this one's from 2022. And let's see, yeah, it doesn't have any citations for it yet. Um, and of course, as a newer article, it may not have any yet, but I could be wrong. Um, and then it does list is the references that it is citing. Um, so you know, it, it just depends on the tool, I guess. Um, and like I said, I'm not sure for the more recent year, but it does have up through 2022 pretty accurately, it looks like, um, based on my searching so far. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I know we're running out of time. So are there any other questions for me at this point? And I do hope you'll continue the conversation at your institution as well internally. I just wanted to say thank you for bringing up the graphic, uh, that graphic design element piece. That was interesting. I've compared the AI tool generator in Canva and also Adobe when they released their products. So um, they're not getting really good ratings sorted by now. So I'll take a look at the one you introduced. Yeah. And of course, I will mention sometimes it does have wonky eyes and stuff and it looks crazy, but um, it, it looks like it's improving. So we'll see. <laughs> All right, any other final question before I close the session? No? Okay, well, thanks for attending today's session and I will share out the recording with Lisa after it's available. And yeah, good luck creating and figuring out how to deal with generative AI, because I know it's a challenge. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.